And I've been uh, watching a uh, a podcast called The New Atlas. I don't know if you're familiar with it at all. Mm -hmm. It's a ex uh, serviceman who um, who is living in the Southeast Asia and commenting on things. And he um, there's a couple of IDF guys doing that too. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> not not lo beloved of Israel. <laughs> yeah, but um, he uh, he provides a lot of inter interesting background information on the. Uh, on the situation, and he, uh, one of the statements he's made is that the uh, Russian war industry has been geared up appropriate to supply what they really need, and uh, he character he contrasted that to the United States war industry, which is uh, mostly interested in gouging profits and not and uh, not really geared up to. Uh, Right. providing what's needed and I was wondering if you have a no there's take some, on that. there's some truth to that um, I'd be careful about how I would uh, use that as a predictor of the future of warfare though because what we are seeing in Ukraine that is I think more of a predictor is how the meshing of drones intelligence surveillance ultimately artificial intelligence and the whole network of what, what we call network warfare, warfare, how it's changing the battlefield, completely changing the battlefield. And frankly, we're all behind in that. In many respects, Ukraine is an amalgam of the future, the present, and the past. And you're seeing it all play out on the battlefield and you're seeing a lot of people die principally because they are engaged in that middle sector or that rearward sector while the forward sector is tearing them up. The Russians are taking the most lessons from this. And let me back up a minute and tell you that in 2013 and 2014, the Swiss and the Finns, um, one year, I think 13 was Norwegians too, came to America and gave us at the Center for Naval Analyses some briefings on what the Russians were doing in terms of their core-sized exercises. These are huge exercises. Russia's probably the only country in the world with the terrain to do this sort of thing, and the citizens who will tolerate it. We might have the terrain, but our citizens wouldn't tolerate it. Think of the Louisiana maneuvers right before World War II, where George Marshall and his boys proved Patton's theory of armored warfare was a match for the Germans and such. Huge operations. You know, they took up the whole state of Louisiana and part of East Texas. Um, from those exercises, they discovered a couple of really important things. One, the Russians didn't know how to use drones worth a squat. They had no idea how to use drones, especially ISR drones, intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance drones, let alone armed drones. They didn't have any armed drones. So guess who stepped in and sent trainers and sold them drones and armed ones. Israel. <laughs> we did too, but the Israelis were the principal ones. The second year, 2014, big improvement. They had learned how to control all these things, to coordinate them, to use them in a core size exercise, which is no, no small problem. Um, so you guys just got to imagine in 15 and 16 and 17 when they did these, do them every year, they probably got even better and got even better equipment. Well, what the war did for them, and I was looking at the economic graphs the other day, what the war did for them initially was, you know, kind of give them a, a wake-up call in terms of, well, you hit a fairly valorous, courageous bunch of people, they can inflict a lot of casualties on you. They never intended to go to Kiev. So, I mean, those old pictures that our press showed about the columns being stopped and turned around and sent back, that was all bull. They never intended to do that. They were just trying to invest those eastern oblasts. So what they've learned now in their industrial base and what they've done in their, in their industrial base and in their military doctrine and training and the exercises that they're still doing, you never stop exercising even if you're fighting a war, they have become really good, and their economy has really taken off. And if you look at the charts on the economy, you'll see you, there's this one set out there. I, th I can't remember who the source was. It might have been, uh, been the Wall Street Journal, of all things. 
that's another thing I didn't talk about. Our media is just pitiful. Main, mainstream media is horrible. Propagandists for the administration. And the New York Times works for Israel. The New York Times works for Israel. Read any article and see how many times they sort of take on the Palestinians and how many times they praise the IDF, the Jews, and everything else as they go down the list. It's incredible. But if you look at these charts, what you see is that prior to about 2014, 2015, the major trade on the top positive side of the graph of Russia is with the United States or with the Western Hemisphere. When you look at it post-2021, 2022, and even more dramatically in 2023, it's flipped over. Almost no trade with North America, and their trade is a reflection of the previous top trade with North America with India and China. So India and China have not only taken and filled the gaps, they've pushed the Russian growth probably GDP-wise, which is a terrible measure of growth, but I'll use it, to about 2.8, 2.9, maybe even 3%. But what they've really done is revived, helped them revive their industrial base. And North Korea and China in particular are providing things. I wouldn't even be surprised, I don't know this, but I wouldn't be surprised if Israel's defense industry is not still selling them things because Israel will sell to anybody, anybody, anytime, any place that has the cash or something to give them. Um, and, and we're pretty much that way, too, so I shouldn't be complaining about Israel. Um, so you've got a reverse situation economically than anybody thought. I think Joe Biden was convinced by Sullivan and Biden and all the rest of that crew that our sanctions would do. That's another thing. Our, you know we have over 2.6 billion people in the world officially under OFAC, Office of Financial Assets Control and Treasury, sanctioned. Those people hate our guts. It's not good. It's not good policy to go making 2.6 billion people hate your guts. Add another billion who hate our guts because they see us and China and other northern tier countries too as the perpetrators of climate change, which is already in the global south affecting them significantly. And they didn't put those pollutants up there. We did. And we're not doing what we should be doing for them. That's the way they look at it. Um, with $35 trillion in aggregate national debt. There's good reason why we aren't probably, but that doesn't excuse it. So we are making enemies of fully a quarter, maybe a third of the world. Every day we are building that enemy list. There's a precept of international relations called conservation of enemies. Simply stated, it says, no prudent state, there's the key word, not insane state. No prudent state ever wants more enemies than it can handle at any one time. Took them off. We've got a third of the world that hates our guts. 